Program, this is Leadership Development from Richard. Richard. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Fun. Thank you, yes. Uh, my name is Richard Self, I'm from the University of Derby and I've been involved in teaching analytics and governance for oh, about four years now. I led the development of business analytics in the School of Computing and Maths over the last three, four years and we developed undergraduate and master's degrees. Now the thing that's unique about our two degrees is the emphasis on ethics and governance. Because as I will explain a little bit today, um, there's an awful lot of things we can do, and we just saw an interesting example just now. Um, but the real question is, should we be doing these? And as current leaders in your field, there are quite a lot of things I think you um, can do to make the public perception of analytics more acceptable. There's also many things you can do as a leader to ensure that your organization is safe as of 25th of May next year, when GDPR hits every country in the world, every organization in the world that holds personal information, manipulates it or whatever um, for EU citizens. The USA is surprised, I think, at the extraterritoriality, which one shouldn't be surprised, they shouldn't be surprised because many of their laws have fairly draconian extraterritoriality um, conditions. So the EU is doing something really spectacular and we need to think about some of the interesting questions. I want to look at um, the algorithmic transparency requirement of GDPR today, eventually. And what I'm going to be covering, starting with leadership aspects, to kind of open up what is leadership, what do we think of as really good leadership, in a way that helps our own staff to really deliver some of the most spectacular things that are both legal and add business value. So I will, we'll be looking at um, ethics, be looking a little bit at how leaders should be developing the right mindset and Jonas this morning at the first session or second session uh, was talking a bit about how he does that with his own staff within his own group and then this thing called GDPR very very far-reaching indeed Of most importance within this leadership thing is the ability to inspire, to enthuse, empower, and also trust your own staff so that they too can trust you. That's part of what means has led me to be where I am today, invited to several management events. events um, this year, and one or two, once already known for next year. Three years ago, I wasn't on the conference scene at all. I was having almost no influence other than a small number of undergraduate students. Yet here I am, a year and a half, two years later, at many big business conferences, being heard and possibly, I hope, influencing in a good way. You guys who would never see anything coming out of universities other than reasonably employable undergraduates. So there'll be a little bit about a short bit of my story that comes from inspired, empowering, enthusing uh, um, leadership. And then we'll move into the main section on analytics, governance, uh, trust, ethics, in relation to data, in relation to algorithms, and then a little brief, brief bit as well about big data versus small data. We hear huge amounts about big data, but very little about small data. And then after that, I'll move on to some of the serious consequences of algorithms, algorithmic transparency under GDPR. Starting with approach to leadership and management. 
Is that what you're doing, trying to herd sheep? Rushing around with these unmanageable things, running off in every direction, except where you want them to go? Or, are you like that? My sheep know my voice, and they follow me. A little infographic about leadership. Are these enough? Yes, we know about the importance of vision, of where we want to get to, of how we're going to get there. Many of us have passion for the things that we are involved with. Do we have that passion about our work? Or is it about our hobbies at home and our families that we have passion for, but not about work? If you are going to lead people towards goodness, are you passionate about that as well? We have all experienced during our careers leaders or people above us who tell us what they want us to do, and then they do the exact it. I remember a case long ago when I worked at Rolls-Royce Aerospace uh, as we introduced laptops back in the late 80s for the travelling <coughs> seniors. We had very, very, very strict rules for our PCs in the offices. Thou shalt not load any other software onto the PCs. So most of us did that. And occasionally someone slipped in a game and ended up with Leisure Suit Larry and the nasty gotcha when you finally got the very, very top end of the game, it wiped your hard drive. One or two people did that and we all learnt the lesson. But one director I remember, he was out on the road on the flights many, many days a year, many weeks a year, and he, he was a bit, he was youngish, he loved his games. This is back in the late 80s, so they weren't very powerful games. And the number of times his PC had to be rebuilt, for the obvious reasons. There's a rule for me and there's a rule for the rest of you. Walk the talk, do what you say that we all have to do. We have to be good at communications. That's what leadership is about. That's what senior management is about. Communicating. And as Jonas pointed out this morning, it's also the problem in our field of analytics. There's vast numbers of geeks out there who are brilliant statisticians. They're fantastic at, at machine modeling, at machine learning and AI. They know all the statistics that underpin all of analytics, all of machine learning. They can't string a six words together. They can't tell a story. We have to be able to tell the stories. We have to be able to persuasively present our ideas, convince people that our conclusions and recommendations are well-researched, well-founded, and are a good solution. Maybe not necessarily the best, the best is enemy of the good, we really remember. But communication is incredibly important. And how often in our career have we failed to understand the message that's being presented? Or is presented in a way that doesn't remotely capture our interest? There's a lovely example from politics a few years ago in, in the UK. One senior politician had a particular perspective, and he was presenting it and talking about it day in, day out. And I was making no headway. The electorate didn't get it. Now, as a communicator, as a politician, he should have known the fundamental of communication. You have to communicate in the thoughts and the languages, language and the feelings of the audience. So if I fail to connect to you today, the failure is not yours, which is what he said. He said it was the problem of the electorate. They didn't understand what he was saying. Wrong. If 
you don't understand me, if you don't connect me to me, if you don't believe me, the failure is not yours, the failure is mine. I'm a communicator. I have the responsibility for communicating in the way that you will understand and appreciate. And then as leaders, yes, we need to have courage. We're going in directions that maybe no one has ever been before. Disrupt our business before others disrupt it for us, as the last, the last presentation said. But then there comes a time when courage becomes too much. And if we look back at 2007, 2008, there were signs long before that that the world was going to implode over the subprime mortgages. Many, many chief execs, I suspect, knew that the business was unsustainable, but they too knew that if they got off the roundabout before the music stopped, they would get sacked. They couldn't afford to because they were making so much money until it failed catastrophically. April, uh, August 2008. So there are those five ideas there about leadership. Are there any more? And I'd argue, yes, there are indeed many. The most important ones I want to look at today is inspiring, empowering, and trusting. Now my little story starts with a 48-year career at Rolls-Royce Aerospace. Ended up being on the teams that it re completely re-engineered all of our engineering systems at Rolls-Royce Aerospace and then replaced all of our business systems with SAP. Um, yeah, and it started off long, but a bit before that with a very pleasant three years at, Rolls -Royce, at uh, Jesus College Cambridge as an undergraduate apprentice of Rolls-Royce. Worked for Rolls-Royce for a long, long time, and now I've been at the University of Derby since 2002 as a senior lecturer. So how did all of that end up with me here in front of you? Well, it all started really about, well I suppose over, over the years at university I've been sort of talking to, I'm teaching students, interacting with students, um, had a spell when I was in, in and out of southern Africa, Malawi, Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe, for about three or four times a year on the business master's um, uh, programme, getting to know a lot of the middle and senior management of the SMEs and big, so-called big organisations in those countries. Now I was privileged because I supervised many, or went out and talked to many of the students for their final dissertation project, they were working with the truth. They had to talk about how their companies succeeded or failed, otherwise they weren't going to be able to do good assignments or good uh, dissertations. So I and about two other uh, colleagues learned more about how businesses work in real in those countries than almost anybody else except those who work there. But for, in terms of people outside of the country, there are probably very few people who had our experience of how the place really worked. You know, people like the World Bank who wander in, they will never see what's really going on. So I understood a lot about what was work, making businesses work successfully, less successfully, and some not particularly so at all. And then, about five, four years ago, I started getting involved in LinkedIn and started doing the usual stuff. Not to make, basically make contacts and publicise some of my ideas, but learn from people out there. And then suddenly, in the middle of a, an away day, I got an invitation to come and speak. Because I've been publish, publishing on YouTube all of my lectures and my uh, academic conference uh, presentations. And then it suddenly snowballed. Now I'm invited by about six or eight different event organisers, conference organisers around the UK and uh, Europe to um, come to do these sort of things. Now this is not normal for academics. Not at all. 
they, most academics live in a rather closed kind of world. They go to the big academic conferences where your track has the three presenters plus the chair and maybe two or three other attendees. And you write your papers for the three-star academic journals to get all the right ticks in the box and so on. And those papers are seen by academics and by a few researchers and nobody outside. And yet, suddenly, here I am in front of you guys. How did that happen? Well, it was because I had an inspirational leader. He wasn't the usual micromanager who keeps everything tight, who you have to go and ask permission before you even sort of sneeze almost, it seemed like, if, if you look at some of our academic managers. No, this guy was different, completely different. He wanted people out there. He wanted people to understand and know that University of Arby was active in the field now of analytics and governance. And instead of saying, no, of course you can't, that's not going to tick the right boxes for your career, Richard. Uh, yeah, get out there. Do it. See what happens. How many of you want to go to, Richard? Well, just see what comes up. It didn't hurt that management events kind of cover the costs, which is also kind of useful. Now, what it also meant, and an, another strand of this empowering from this uh, dean, was that he wanted me to think about completely new ways of inspiring the students. So that I wasn't rushing around behind them, managing the students all the time, spending all of my time telling them the fascinating, magical things, at least to me, about the topic areas. And I changed, I was encouraged to change the way that I actually interacted with students, the way that I organized my time in front of the students, and the result was really quite spectacular. I no longer teach much of the topic. They can go and learn it. How many of you know SAS or have used SAS? Any of you? Did you go on the base SAS course of 35 up, right? But there's a 35 hour program with 20 chapters that you can work through, vast numbers of exercises, and at the end of it, you kind of know base SAS, the bottom stuff, the, the real coding part of SAS. Now, most universities will run something like that course for the whole term, three hours a week, going through SAS. Great, so at the end of it, you know a bit about the grammar and semantics of SAS. That's training, that's not education. What we do on all of our languages in our analytics program is Here's the teaching material. If we've got it, go learn. If we haven't got it, go find it. Just like your, you know, when you get a graduate coming in, or maybe you have a placement undergraduate who hasn't actually learned Python yet, you say, go learn Python, it's easy. There's lots of stuff out there. And so that's what we do. <coughs> I spend all my time guiding and mentoring them, talking to them about the questions that are interesting. In our field, I've been in it now since 1969, before that. In IT, there are no new questions, virtually. The questions have been the same for 35, 40 years. The answers change every day, every week, every month. And they're different in every organization. If every one of you in your organizations ask yourselves the same question, what is the best analytics um, environment? Well, it's difficult to say. What are you trying to do? What is the business model that you need to be managing? What is the culture within your organization? And you will all come up with different approaches, different, slightly subtly different answers to Okay, someone's going to go for Python. Some of us in certain industries will go for SAS because it has that hard guarantee which you haven't got with open source for certain business critical aspects. And so I am there teaching us, helping our students to learn soft skills, communication, creativity, problem identification and solving, um, collaboration, 
critical thinking, and most importantly, concentrating on telling the story. So that in principle, you or Jonas could employ most of the good graduates, because they are all capable of telling good stories. So a tremendous change from, on the governance sort of side, ten, eight, ten years ago, it was three hours of, here is all the stuff that's really great for you to know. And it goes in that year and falls out of that um, almost totally. Now, they engage with a subject. They choose a topic for assessment, which is exactly what interests them, not what interests me. They allowed great freedom as I lead them forward. So leadership is not just at the top coming down to me and stopping at me, it carries on down to the guys below me, the students who I'm teaching. I'm, they, I'm seen to be one of the more inspiring of the um, academics because I've been given that opportunity, the trust to develop things. So moving on now a little bit to the main part. So that's what leadership is, that's how empowering and inspiring and trusting has led me to be here. The challenge for you, of course, is how are you going to do, can you do the same thing to the people below you? Now, if we look certainly under the UK Companies Act, 2006 in section 172, there's a very, very interesting paragraph about the, re the responsibilities of the senior executives in an organisation. And these are similar across many, many jurisdictions. <clears throat> Unfortunately, these do not have um, a legally enforceable Capability. These are strong, strong recommendations. There's been some debate about six months ago in, in LinkedIn, actually, about can these be enforced? Can, can shareholders or employees take the executives to court? And it's kind of very difficult. This is particularly important for item B, which I'm not going to talk about today, to consider the um, what does it say? To consider the interests of the company's employees in decision making. That's actually relevant for IT because we keep developing all these broken systems that only do part of the job and raise the stress levels. If we look at stress over the last 20 odd years, as a result of many of these partial systems that get imposed on people, it's raising stress rather high. Um, and it's kind of an interesting question to me at a governance level. Why are we keeping on imposing systems which don't actually make the life of our uh, employees easier? Why do they always, or almost always, make the life of our employees more difficult? Think about expense claims. It used to be easy. Here was a spreadsheet that's converted all the expenses into sterling, feed it to an admin person with a piece of paper that said, I want, I'm claiming for this, see if that spreadsheet, £100. Today, half an hour, an hour later, entering line item by line item, you know, even a hotel bill has to be broken down into 20 line items day by day, the, uh, the, the cost of the room, the taxes, and the three meals. You know, it takes about an hour and a half now to do that, when it used to take 20, uh, 10 minutes. That's not helpful. So that's one of the reasons why well, that I think is interesting about that one, but it's unenforceable, sadly. So, likely consequence of a decision in the long term, the desirability of the company maintaining a reputation of high standards of business conduct. Think of Equifax last week. Anybody heard about Equifax last week? 143 million sets of ID lost over a period of about mm, two or three months. Nobody's entirely sure quite how long it was before they closed the hole a hole that they knew about three months previously, and apparently, possibly, maybe, have tried to so uh, close it but failed. We're not really sure what the story is yet.
We've seen a lot over the last six months about corporate culture, particularly the corporate culture of Uber. From Kalanick's outburst and on the bottom right, the gross levels of uh, sexism within the organization, uh, Amit Sangal recruited and then resigned within a month or so because of his history. We have the potential lawsuit going on between Waymo, Google Waymo and uh, Uber over the technology. They've lost Kalanick completely. He now is just a shareholder. And then last week, Uber is in danger of losing his license in London and many other uh, towns and cities probably. It's lost its license in many uh, cities around the world because of the way that it treats itself as we are a technology platform, we are not a uh, taxi company, therefore we are not subject to most of the regulations that taxi companies and private hire companies have to ab abide by. And the simplest solution for Uber is to say, yep, we are a taxi company to all intents and purposes. We may not own our taxes, but then private hire companies don't necessarily own them all. But we will. If they were to really understand that they are just like an ordinary company, that they are no longer anything different in any significant terms, except they are global. But we're seeing a lot of debate these days about big tech companies. Are they really disruptive platforms, or are they, as Google and YouTube could be considered, or Facebook, publishers now? They like to claim they're just a platform to allow us to self-publish. And therefore, none of the uh, news type communication, technology, uh, to communication industry rules apply to them. And they're getting very, very touchy about some of these things. But you see, the problem is, whilst we like to use their services, and in many respects, we rely on them, we rely on Google Maps, we rely on Apple Maps, we rely on Google as a search engine, we rely on U uh, YouTube as a, a, a medium of communication, of um, entertainment and so on. We could do without them, we don't want to, but, we're beginning to see a groundswell that says these guys need to be regulated. And if we, if we go back over history, when they first, when utilities were first introduced, like you know, water and gas and electricity, they were to quite a large extent fairly unregulated when they first came in. But now, when it be they became the must-have that underpins civilization, regulation started coming in. And I think we're beginning to see the signs that most of these technologies, whether it's Airbnb or Uber or Google or Amazon or Facebook, these are now becoming fundamental utilities for we, for the population, and therefore probably need to be regulated. If they aren't regulated, then perhaps we need to think about our business models and become more could we say, civil society friendly. Now moving on to the topics of analytics and data. An incredible range of data sources about us, about our customers. We've seen a couple of presentations there about our customers. We've got magical technologies, we can sort of, like that, track where we go to pretty high accuracy, much higher accuracy, or considerably higher accuracy than our, any of our smartphones are capable of using, sort of GPS trackers and such like. We've got the data that we trust, our corporate data that we trust that comes in from our tills. Our master data and everything else in the ERP systems like SAP. Then we have some somewhat accurate devices and some 
pretty un inaccurate devices. Interestingly, when I ended with the Rolls Royce, I kind of assumed that all, pretty much most of the data in our systems was reasonably accurate until we implemented SAP and went through the usual ERP implementation program of data cleansing. And suddenly you lose 70% of all the data that's in your system because it's kind of out of date or it's wrong. Because you want SAP to start up nice and clean. You press the button, it does all the master scheduling and everything else, and you know at least that probably that first scheduling run, pretty much everything is comp comparatively accurate. Your stock levels may be plus or minus a little bit because you might not have done a complete stock take to prove that you got 10 rather than 11 of this or that or the other. However, the proposition, which I have no real evidence to doubt, is that 80% probably of all our data that we are using today is of uncertain veracity. Not that it's wrong, or that all of it's wrong, but we can't easily determine whether it is right or wrong, or by how much it is wrong. And take that tracking data for um, that car, using GPS on the smartphone, and it's an inertial uh, chip, and it's gyro chip. <clears throat> Those are all very cheap technology, fairly sensitive, which need very, very complex algorithms to make sense of what they're actually uh, measuring. Almost all of that data will be, to some extent, incorrect. You will not be where it says you are, and you may or may not be accelerating exactly as fast or as slow as it says you are. That means you have governance questions. How much error can you tolerate when you do your clever things with the data. Now, I tended to feel when I first saw this presented by John Easton back in 2012 or thereabouts at a SAS conference, I kind of assumed that at least the enterprise data is going to be the stuff that we can rely on. Until I came across a lovely example of a company who five years previously had em implemented SAP and had suddenly realized that the data was now getting unclean. And they had to, five years after starting with clean data, had to start running a data cleansing exercise on a continuous basis on the master data. So every source of data we have is contaminated. And the problem is determining which is contaminated without data cleansing or decide, doing a special exercise may be to work out what the level of errors are so that you can then determine at a business level how much error can I tolerate. Now if you're looking at the clustering and the sort of stuff that Jonas was talking about, probably you can tolerate reasonable levels. If, however, you are using machine technology to make decisions on an individual person's data <clears throat> to guide your interaction with them, maybe to say, no, you cannot have an insurance policy, no, you cannot have um, a financial services offering or a loan, then that data veracity problem becomes kind of interesting. As an example, I've been running with my undergraduate students for the last three or four years, projects at the end of, during their final year, to try and characterize the accuracy of location services on smartphones. And this, at the beginning, we were using them to take location tagged uh, photos, because you can, in principle, then identify on Google Maps, Google Earth, or whatever, what, exactly where you took that photo from, and then see what the photo recorded as its guess. Now, yesterday, I, uh, in the evening after I got here, I walked across the bridge and a bit round the park and took a whole load of photos. And only about one of those photos I took outdoors was 
anywhere near. I was, you know, just, you know the, where the two bits of the river come together at the point, and there's that little um, statue on the court on, on the path there. Now I was standing under the tree and took three or four photos at various directions, and not one of those photos was within 50 to 100 meters of where I was actually standing. That's the accuracy of these little devices, guys. Now, in a good situation, I can get them accurate to within a couple of feet, less than a metre. But not one of the photos I've taken around this bit of Zurich, it, up, maybe a couple down by the museum, I'm not sure yet, um, none of them are within 30 to 50 metres of where I was. Now, when I gave this, uh, that bit of the talk down in Barcelona last year to the uh, management events, uh, European Retail Summit. The retailers there, who are obviously wanting to use uh, location-based uh, marketing, were kind of a little bit surprised at how inaccurate their phones are. I've got examples where photos are a thousand uh, miles in error. It's not very helpful targeting someone, here is your local Starbucks offer, when you're a thousand miles away. That has Consequences. It has reputational consequences. Now, what you would do, once you understand that, is how many times is that going to happen? One in a hundred thousand? Can't be bothered. Not, not relevant. If it's happening, you no know, one in twenty, one in thirty, and you're a hundred, two hundred meters in error, you kind of begin to start thinking, can we rely on this to not get reputational damage. Health monitoring gadgetry is kind of interestingly inaccurate. One of my daughters lent me a uh, Garmin Vivo, uh, Vivo Fit device round, around that Christmas. So I paired it up with my phone <coughs> and also did was you ran the two in parallel. There's 30% difference between the two devices for step counting. Now you would have thought a gadget there and a gadget sitting in a pocket here or maybe up there a kind of would get somewhere near the same number of steps a day. I find it difficult to understand how you can get 30% of difference between the two in terms of counting steps. The reality actually is very, very simple. Most of them are using tiny, little, very cheap accelerometers, which are mind-bendingly sensitive. Now you can put one on the table here, and I guess if someone hits the table at the back there, it would probably measure the vibration. Now that means you have to have some remarkable algorithms to kind of filter out all the minor jitter and everything else. And the problem almost certainly is a combination of different levels of sensitivity of the two sets of accelerometers and two different algorithms, which one of which is slightly better, or somewhat better, 30% better than the other, and actually counting, filtering out that signature of what is a step. Now you say, is that important? Well, you know, you get, I don't know whether many of you use them or go running regularly or exercising, and a lot of medium level, people who are doing some marathons and half marathons and triathlons, they kind of like to track how they're doing towards their target levels of training. And 20% error is a bit worrying. Um, it might be forcing you to do too much exercise, or it might be letting you get away with too little exercise to meet your targets. The GPS is also a little bit random. I've seen a trace where someone was running around the south bank towards the um, Tate Modern Gallery and then going across the Millennium Bridge towards St Paul's. And had a tracker, I think, on the shoe. Or might have been on the wrist, I forget. <coughs> and you can see it tracking nicely all the way around the embankment on the south bank. 
kind of zigzagging in ways that humans don't actually zigzag when they're running. And then, about 150 metres before the start of the Millennium Bridge, this person started running over water. It cut the corner for her. She went that way. GPS said, or the tracker said, gone that way across the water. Reduced her distance by probably 100 metres for that run. And presumably calculated an odd sort of speed. <clears throat> Even high grade things like your sat -navs. You've noticed how when you leave a motorway, it stays on the motorway. If you leave the motorway before it thinks you ought to, it will keep you on the motorway even when you're up the slip road until snap to logic says, this is not real, and you hop. There's a company near Derby who provide fleet management, uh, GPS and other sensor-based uh, technology for fleet managers to understand how their drivers are driving their uh, lorries and their cars and so on. And one of the lessons they learned extremely early, because they streamed the data from their uh, lorries and buses and so on to their central servers. And one of the first lessons they learned was they needed to filter the GPS uh, readings very, very early for sensibility. Because remember, these are not snap to check um, coordinates. Because we're used on our sat nav to see us driving gently straight up the road, don't we? If you actually get at the raw GPS, which I can do with um, that little camera tracker that I, I showed you, you are almost never on the road you think you are. You're in the ditch over there, or you're on the other side of the motorway. You could be anywhere, plus or minus about 20, 30 metres either side of the road you're on. And they discovered they needed to do sensibility checks, because they suddenly were discovering they were getting lorries which were travelling legally at 60, which were doing 70, 80, 90, 100 miles an hour for short distances, because they were doing distance divided by time uh, to get speed. And if you've got a 10 meter error, both wrong way on two readings, that's 60 feet, which is close on um, 50, 50, 60 miles an hour difference to what you should be doing. So we have to think about what all of our data very, very carefully. We also have to think about social media. Many, many organizations are doing a huge amount of sentiment analysis from Twitter feeds and tweets and what have you. The problem we have with many of these sources is we think we have all of the data. We scooped up through the Twitter API every single tweet about something. And in this, from a, your statistician's perspective, I think I've got n, the number in the sample, equals all. Mm, no. You may have got all of the tweets which are tweeted, but they are not. They're probably less than 1%, probably, of the actual population who is interacting with your brand. Maybe even less particularly those who are tweeted, the primary tweeters, rather than the follower retweeters. I remember doing a study, a brief sort of study, many years ago when I was doing my law master's degree, and I was involved in a, a blog site, I guess you could call it, in today's terms. I never found out how many people there were who were part of that particular group, who were the followers, you might say. But what I had done, was to get all of the emails filtered into a single folder. I scooped those out of Outlook, popped them into Excel, and sorted them out. And 95% of all of the emails which went into this blog came from, I think, less than uh, 50 to 100 people around the world. This was an international thing. So N does not equal all. And it's, we're beginning to see some comments of, um, in the analytics sort and sort of data science side of LinkedIn, quite a lot of discussions now about the bias that machine learning has. We saw only four months ago a seriously racist face recognition system which could not recognize black faces. 
very simple answer, obviously, the training set of photos didn't include people with faces uh, darker than, say, roughly Haley Berry's face. I can see one or two faces here that would not have been recognised. You would not be human. And that causes problems for a lot of things. We're finding a lot of predictive analytics is building some fairly biased algorithms. And we need to be thinking about tracking those down. Because GDPR is going to cause us problems with those if it's to do with personal data analysis. We need to think about our sources of data and our training sets. And yes, if you're an insurance company and you pour all of the last six months' transactions through the system, depending on your market share, yes, you've got N equals all for that sample, but it may not be fully representative of the overall market demographics. It may or it may not. We've seen algorithms which were used to do personalised advertising effectively in the US election. We saw a few years ago the target company in the USA developing some very clever algorithms on the data going through the tills plus lots of data which is probably not going to be legal in Europe but they could identify people, the women of their customers who are pregnant in the first trimester. They could forecast within a month when you were going to be delivering your baby. And then they, oops, they've gone. Can you hear me still? Yeah, okay, right, well, I won't take this off, it's too difficult. Uh, and then they started sending out booklets of uh, coupons, which had more than just baby stuff. It wasn't just nest building, that would have been too creepy, they realised. Um, but they so they add in the odd few coupons for lawn mowers and so on. And then the sky fell in. Seriously. I mean, they had already gone out to the press, uh, Washington uh, Journal, I think it was, and one or two others. You can see in the notes for this, um, I think, for this slide, you can see the, the links to some of the actual cuttings. Um, and suddenly one day, Father, um, a man turned up in one of their shops, really very angry, wanting to see the, the uh, store manager waving the book of coupons, saying, what do you want to do? What, I get my daughter pregnant? She's only 16. Known about it. Been kept quiet by marketing. And said, I'll get back to you in a month, in a, or in a week, to find out what's, uh, after I've found out what's going on. Phoned the guy up who said, ah, mm, yes, I have to, have to say sorry. There were things going on at home which I wasn't aware of. It turned out that their young 16-year-old daughter was pregnant and hadn't got up the courage to tell mum and dad. So it was pretty accurate. Is it ethical to do that? Is it ethical to ask those questions? Or, or is it the ethics, were the ethics involved in what marketing did with the story? Or with the insights. And we saw this morning earlier on about what we're doing in analytics is getting the insights, and if we don't do something with them, they're not worth the paper they're written on. But the, I would go further. Should, are there questions we should not ask of our data? And in the UK, for example, insurance companies are not allowed by law to look at DNA data. Insurance companies are desperate to get onto our DNA data because they can, they think at least, that they can do so much to personalise medical treatment and insurance premiums. Cambridge Analytica, basically, if you have got 60 likes on Facebook, some of our wizard technologies can identify the skill, colour of our skin to, with 80% or so accuracy, 88%. 150 likes on Facebook permits a good analyst to know more about you than your parents do. And that was used, it is alleged that that was used for personalised SMS messaging during the American election. 
Cambridge Analytica kind of confusing the issue there. Oh yes, going back to predictives and ethics. GDPR is going to have a say on that one, folks. Almost certainly. Machine learning and health, there are insurance companies who are now offering you uh, reduced ins health insurance premiums for you and your dog if you have a tracker <coughs> and you meet your targets. Except for the dog one, required 80 minutes walking, actual 90 minutes walking in a day, measured 5 minutes walking in a day. People are getting fatter using activity trackers because <coughs> the algorithms that calculate calories burnt are so inaccurate that people think, oh, today I've done 4,500 calories of exercise and, my and I have a target of 250, so that means I've got a free couple of thousand calories. Help, I can have a Big Mac. Vision recognition. The problem with neural networks is we have no clue how they work, other than they are stonking great big matrices of something. There's a lovely story about the American, uh, the American military trying to teach vision system to distinguish between friendly <coughs> and enemy tanks. The training set, they trained it up perfectly. The test set worked perfectly. And of course, we all know that the test set is a subset of the training set which hasn't been put through. So it was the same stuff. Which is what happened obviously with the face recognition which was uh, uh, color blind. Well, sorry, it was racist, it couldn't see black. It turned out that the top example, depending on which version, either the machine had learned to recognize forests and trees, or sunny and cloudy. Not really sure which of the two is the right one. But all, or almost all, of our analytic systems, the clustering, uh, the predictors, even probably the regression models, are going to be biased because of the inherent bias in the data that we have. Because it is never n equals all, which is the total population. It is our subset of what we've got of our customers. I'll skip over security and privacy except for one problem. Vast amounts of our data is personally identified. And remember under GDPR that includes the MAC address of my smartphone, the um, IP addresses and things like that. They are now GDPR protected personal information. This gives us an interesting anonymization problem, I suspect. It also means we have more and more and more data around, and the telcos now have a lot of data which is getting very, very sensitive because it has MAC addresses and phone numbers and mass numbers and et cetera, et cetera, of where I am. So the security problem, the processing problem, there's the transparency of analytics problem as well. Remember, big data is only the data that we had like yesterday and before past data, it's not the future, and it only through statistics tells us the what and when kind of questions. It doesn't tell us why. It doesn't get inside people's heads very easily. And uh, a lot of sentiment analysis is still having problems because we can't really easily understand te the text and tweets. Natural language processing is certainly improving dramatically over the last few years. But it is still pretty difficult to really carry on uh, a good conversation with any of these uh, AI uh, voice recognition systems like Siri and Alexa. They're getting better. But sentiment analysis is complicated because we are very good at irony and it's difficult to pick that up. But if you want to find out what's really going on, you go talk to people. They'll tell you the intent and the why and everything else. <clears throat> Big data analytics, that's why we're here. Yep, 
we're very, very used to and involved with vast amount of algorithms, lots and lots of data. The problem is with most of our algorithms are that unless you are a seriously advanced um, statistician, because let's face it, all of our uh, analytics, including neural networks, is basically applied advanced statistics. No more, no less. And most of these analytics um, type functionality is remarkably opaque. And neural networks probably more so than anything. People are trying to visualize how neural networks are doing their stuff, but it's pretty difficult to be certain what's happening. We tend to scoop up everything we can capture. We then repurpose lots of data. Oh, it's captured on this marketing campaign. Oh, but we can now use it on some infrastructure development. I mean, if you think about the data that the telcos collect just because we pass in and out of cells, there's always at least three towers which know where we are and where we are offsetting between. So I know they can work out within, if for 4G, to within 50 to 100 meters where we are, circular sort of area. So that's kind of useful if you're doing some infrastructure management. Now, now they want to make some money out of it, so they're trying to sell, the, at least at the bulk level, all of this data to people who are doing traffic analysis, designing new bridges, deciding where to put a bridge, where to put a uh, bypass. We're repurposing data all of the time. One of the problem things that GDPR is going, is going to be coming, coming down on us like a ton of bricks is the fact that profiling all of this very clever ways we can use all of the advanced analytics for personal profiling can be very, very intrusive or felt to be very intrusive by the data subjects. That's us in a different hat. Is it within their reasonable expectations? Should when did I really think that the telco could actually track every last activity I do? They know where I live, both from my account number and from the track. They know where I spend the night every night. They know where I go to work. They know where I have pretty closely which part of town I have lunch in if I go out to lunch. And they did this in um, Brazil a few years ago to decide where to build a, uh, a new bridge. The transparency of processing is going to be terribly important. So if I have been refused a loan because of my profile, because of some analytics, some machine decision, I have the right under GDPR to go to the company and say, why? Explain to me, in very simple terms, why your machine has refused me credit. Now, it gets more interesting if you also, <coughs> like I've heard some companies do, every three months, they will take the last three months' worth of data and run it through the training algorithms to find out which of the, of the various 20 models they're interested in using is effective on that lot, which might be different from the previous three months, by the way, as well, and certainly have different tuning parameters. And if I discover that on Friday, if I'd gone to you on Friday, you would have accepted me, but I actually came to you on Monday after the new training, and you reject me, how are you going to explain that to me in words of that I can understand. That's what GDPR transparency of algorithms is all about. We cannot explain in words, I think, in words of two or three syllables, how neural networks work or make their decisions. Yes, we can possibly extract the dense set of matrices that kind of happened. Can anybody tell the story of how that 
actual set of matrices means I can't have a loan today, but I could have had a loan yesterday. So, as we go forward, algorithmic transparency, I think, is going to have some very, very interesting consequences about which technologies we use, particularly where the decision-making applies to a single individual to give or to uh, withhold particular products, um, whether it's insurance, loans, whatever. There are other things. The, all of the slides are already up on my website. The video, which is just being recorded, um, will be up on my YouTube channel in about a couple of days' time. And I will post the link through LinkedIn um, so that you can get at it. But the, the, there's a PDF of this, this, this set of slides in the notes form, so you can see not just the slide, but also the text that goes with it. And you can refresh your memory with the video as well. And I encourage, if you find it interesting, share it to those who you think could do with understanding it. So the leadership question <coughs> is where are you? Are you going to be leading forward or are you going to be sort of catching up from behind? Start thinking about algorithmic transparency, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very inspiring. Thank you. Quite critical. Yeah. Any questions, folks, at all? I think we should do a little lunch. Okay. Rightly, it's lunchtime, folks. But you can talk to me over lunch or after lunch. <laughs> Except.